Good evening. Uh, we'll just wait a minute for people to come in from the waiting room. So good evening once again, I'm Hugh Thomas. I'm the director of the Center for the Humanities. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second book talk of the semester. I'll just go through a, a few slides here. One is on the, the meeting format is in gallery or meeting view. Uh, we'll ask you to stay muted uh, during the talk. Um, if you want to ask any questions at that point, you can put them in the chat. We'll hold questions till the end. Uh, and at the end, you can uh, put questions in the chat or um, use the raise hand function. I just want to note a few upcoming events. Uh, on Friday, this is a workshop for faculty and graduate students at UM. Um, and uh, if you're interested, you need to uh, quickly get a, a copy of the paper and read it. Uh, on uh, Friday, February 25th, we'll be having a workshop uh, by uh, uh, a senior figure from the American Council of Learner Studies about applying for grants there. Uh, our second Stanford talk, actually our third Stanford talk of the year, Don McNeil in early March. And our next book talk. And I'll just note that in the chat, uh, there's a uh, brief description of the book and there's also a link to the publishers if any of you are interested in buying it uh, for tonight's talk. And this is tonight's talk. With that, I will turn it over to Professor Ali of uh, University of Colorado at Boulder uh, to introduce our speaker, uh, Nabil Hussain. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be introducing uh, Nabil today. I've known Nabil for uh, a long time. Our areas of, uh, of research uh, intersect, and so we always encounter one another at conferences. But more than that, Nabil is a dear friend, and so I'm really uh, overjoyed to see the publication of this work, both for him personally and also for what it means uh, for our field. Um, so uh, Professor Nabil Hussein teaches in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Miami. Uh, his research explores authoritarianism in the Middle East, debates on the caliphate, and the development of Islamic thought. Uh, Dr. Hussein began his work as an undergraduate at the University of Virginia, where he studied Arabic, uh, Persian, Islamic history, and Muslim cultures before pursuing study abroad in Syria and in Yemen for years. Uh, during this time abroad, he pursued uh, a seminary education with traditionally trained Sunni and Shi'i scholars. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Nabil has produced a very su substantial and significant genealogical work in Arabic, um, uh, uh, which uh, deserves recognition as well. Uh, Dr. Hussein returned to the United States to obtain a master's in Arabic and Islamic studies from Harvard University, and then finally his PhD uh, from the Near Eastern Studies Department, the, the uh, famed Near Eastern Studies Department of Princeton University, where Nabil worked with um, um, uh, somebody who uh, we say in Arabic, somebody who uh, doesn't require any introduction, Hussein. Mudarisi Tabatabai. <clears throat> He's the recipient of a Fulbright Award uh, and the University of Miami Fellowship in the Arts and Humanities. Um, the family of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and their descendants, who are known as Alids, occupy a central place in Nabil's research. Uh, he published his first book, Opposing the Imam. Uh, which was published in 2021 by Cambridge University Press, examines the history of early Muslims who were hostile to Islam's fourth caliph, Ali, and his descendants. Uh, Professor Hussein aims to continue interrogating the intellectual and political histories of the Alid family in his future work. Uh, thank you very much. And without further ado, uh, Nabil. <clears throat> 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for that kind uh, introduction, Aron. And I'd also like the center. I'd like to thank the Center for Humanities for this opportunity to share uh, some of my research and uh, the ideas that I've been thinking about over the past uh, eight years. And so I will title this talk "Reflections on the Story of Ali in Sunni Islam," and it is a uh, a brief introduction to some of the themes that I consider uh, in uh, in my book that uh, uh, Own uh, kindly um, mentioned. So how did we get here? Ali ibn Abi Talib, the fourth caliph in Islamic history, the man at the center of the portrait before you, was the close kinsman of the Prophet Muhammad, who married Muhammad's daughter Fatima, and thus became the father of all of the Prophet's grandchildren. He's revered for his wisdom, swordsmanship, and piety. He almost needs no introduction among Muslims. He's revered as a saint. And for many, he's the second holiest figure after the Prophet Muhammad. He's assassinated in 660 of the Common Era after four turbulent years as Caliph. Now, the ghettoizing of Ali in Muslim culture and in academia, I would argue, is quite common. His life and political career is only ever discussed in the context of Shiism. The same can be said about his famous son, Hassan, depicted on your left, and his son, Hussein, depicted on your right, the latter being famously killed in a large-scale massacre that is commemor commemorated each year in Shi'i culture. There is an unspoken rule that these heroes of Shiism and the life that they led after the Prophet's death is only to be discussed in Shi'i settings, or in Sunni settings that aim to implicitly or explicitly discredit Shi doctrines about these figures. So why write this book? This book aims to provide a context and a space to understand the tensions, the stories, and the evolution of understandings about the political lives of these figures in non-Shi settings. Thus, I directed my attention primarily to Sunnism, studying Sunni hadith, uh, Sunni hadith considered canonical and others that were not. I also turned to the, to the literature of another sect prevalent in North Africa and Oman, known as the Ibadis. I also then turned to an influential and early rationalist theological school known as the Mu'tazila to understand the diverse ways in which the stories of Ali and his son Hussein have been told by Muslims outside of the context of Shiism. The impetus to write this book came from the discovery that this venerated Sunni caliph and Shi'i imam, and here I'm speaking of Ali, was once publicly reviled in Muslim societies. I hope to understand the processes that facilitated in the rehabilitation of his tarnished reputation in Sunni Islam. I also aim to understand the claims of Ali's antagonists and their grievances against him in particular. The relative obscurity and or extinction of sects upholding such views required that I look at Muslim literature across a number of genres. I engage in the first detailed study of the claims and arguments of Muslims who are opposed to the caliphate of Ali. Lastly, I wanted to understand the ways in which the views of early antagonist Ali endure in Islamic theology and literature until today. So what are some key terms we'll consider tonight? There are many schools in the religion of Islam, each one consisting of revered scholars who define what is orthodoxy or correct belief in the sight of God. This evening, I'll consider the way in which Sunnism, the largest doctrinal school in the Muslim world, grappled with the diversity of stories and views on the life of Ali. Second, when I speak of canonical Hadith collections, I'm speaking of those sayings of the Prophet Muhammad that were compiled in the Sunni tradition that came to be sources for orthodoxy and orthopraxy, or ritual and law in the Sunni tradition. The most revered collection is the one that is referred to in Arabic as al jamia al sahih or the authentic collection of a scholar named Bukhari who was active about 200 to 250 years after the prophet's death. I don't wanna get into the details, but the canonical culture around this book is one where faithful Sunnis believe that in terms of historicity, this collection is basically unimpeachable. It's comprised of hadith, uh, which are considered bona fide sayings of the prophet, and other revered collections may have authentic reports as well, but you could say that these other respected books can be used as references and scholars can investigate their contents for possibly authentic reports 
At the other end of the spectrum are biographical and historical texts. If you are a Sunni scholar who wished to define orthodoxy and you found a text that disagreed with your sensibilities and it came from a non-canonical source, the choice was easy. You could simply reject that source or reject the credibility of that hadith or that text. And now since I consider Muslim literature across multiple genres, I compare claims about Ali made in all of these different types of sources. While acknowledging when the source is canonical and when it is not, and the tensions that arise when a canonical source preserves something that later representatives of orthodoxy didn't like. This is something that I discuss in detail in the final chapter of my book. Lastly, I want to stake some territory for reverence for Ali in Sunni culture, or I can say reverence for Ali in non shi circles. This explains the phenomenon of hundreds of hadith praising him in Sunni literature and non shi theologians who painstakingly argued against other members of their school on why Ali was a legitimate caliph or why he was a saint and a spiritual heir to the prophet Muhammad. And they did this at a time when many of their peers doubted or scoffed at such doctrinal positions as uh, specifically Shi'i doctrines. I'd argue that while the earliest partisans of Ali may have had the identifier of Shi'i, it expanded beyond this group to include Muslims who revered him while having political and theological allegiances elsewhere. Thus reverence for Ali or pro-Ali sentiment over the three centuries that, fo that followed his death became a trans-sectarian phenomenon, meaning it was not just part of Shiism, but gradually became part of Sunnism as well. Only a minority of Muslims followed a school dedicated to Ali and his family, or what became known as Shiism, and the majority of Muslims until today understood religious and political authority as falling on all of the Prophet's disciples rather than just his family. This hegemonic belief is a cornerstone of Sunnism. It's with that introduction that I want to briefly consider the contours of pro-Ali sentiment and to understand the stature of Ali through Muslim literature about him. So at the very end of chapter 33, verse 33 of the Quran, the verse reads, indeed, God desires to keep all impurities from you, O members of the house, and purify you a thorough purification. It's known as the verse of purity or ayat tatir, and it's related in canonical sources that the prophet took his daughter Fatima, Ali, and their two sons and prayed, that, and prayed that God purify them when this verse was revealed. Muslims understood the prophet's prayer to have been accepted and answered. The community also agrees that Ali is the only caliph raised by the prophet from infancy. On this subject, Ali is reported to have said in a collection of uh, sayings attributed to him known as uh, the peak of eloquence or Nahjul Balagha. When I was a baby, or he would say, certainly you know my special status in the eyes of God's messenger and the close kinship I share with him. When I was only a child, he took charge of me and he brought me into his home. When I was a baby, he would hold me to his chest and cradle me in his arms. When I slept, I did so in his bed and beside him, so close that I could smell his fragrance. To feed me, he would first chew the food and then offer it to me. As a child, never did he find me speaking a lie nor any foolishness in my actions. Here we see Ali discussing how he was the only person among the prophet's disciples to be raised in his home. He states that even as a child, he was obedient to the prophet and followed the path of virtue. For Shi'is, these statements reflect the infallibility of Ali, a doctrine upheld as orthodoxy in Shi'ism. The monologue continues, God sent a mighty angel to the prophet in order to guide him both day and night along the path of fine morals and the perfection of character. During this time, I followed him like a young camel who follows the footprints of its mother. Every day he would stand as a banner and symbol of righteousness and morality and command me to follow him. Every year he would retreat and seclude himself in the mountains in the caves of Hira, which is in Mecca. There I would see see him where no one else would see him. In those days, Islam did not exist in any house except in the house of God's prophet. He lived in this house with his wife Khadija, and after these two, I was the third. I saw the light of divine revelation and breathed in the scent of prophethood. Now, the question of authenticity aside, there's a sense here that the intent of this monologue is to convince the listener that Ali is clearly the best person to follow and to trust after the prophet. 
Ali is telling his audience that he had a uniquely intimate relationship with the prophet. Uh, and the implicit argument here is that others can't claim to be superior to him in their knowledge of the prophet or in being closer to him. Now, it's true that the prophet seemed to have, pro uh, seemed to have approved of Ali in ways that were unique. One indication of this is that the prophet declined all other marriage proposals from prominent Muslims who wanted to marry his daughter, Fatima. Both he and Fatima held that only Ali would be a suitable spouse for her. Shis believed that Fatima had a piety or a spiritual stature that was peerless among women. And so her spouse was also to resemble her in this peerlessness. Now it can be also said with confidence that the prophet viewed Ali as his apprentice and trusted companion. It's for this reason that the prophet says of Ali, he is of my essence and I am of his, or in another report, Ali and myself are raised from the same light, or you are my brother in this world and in the hereafter, or you are unto me as Aaron was unto Moses. Now, so far we've considered characteristics of Ali that are affirmed in canonical sources, but when we turn to non-canonical hadith, statements that medieval Sunni scholars didn't affirm were authentic, we get into murkier waters. You could say that the claims get more provocative. So let's look at an example. Historians note that the prophet said of Ali, you are my heir, vizier, and successor after me. This sounds pretty straightforward regarding whom the prophet favored as his successor. But there's a part of the statement that copyists of manuscripts could not agree upon. In some places, the prophet says, fi ahli, and in other statements, or in, and in other copies, the statement is fi ummati. The ramifications of either statement are predictably enormous, Otherwise, I wouldn't be bringing it up. So according to one manuscript, the prophet is simply noting that Ali will be the next chief of their family, namely the Hashmid tribe to which they both belong. In another, the statement is much wider in scope. The prophet is appointing him as his successor in the entire community. Now, the reason why the manuscripts had this uh, difference is that if you look at the Arabic, uh, what one would call the rasam or the skeletal uh, letters of it without the vowels or dots, uh, uh, the rasam or the skeletal uh, text uh, looks quite similar. They're hard to differentiate over time. And since we have both versions, we are left asking, is this a Shi'i affirming text, a smoking gun, if you will, that's defanged of its bite? Or is this an innocuous text enhanced with a Shi'i accretion, right? And so the authors I study in this book, especially in chapters three and five, Al-Jahith and Ibn Taymiyyah are adamant in supporting the second theory. So in this case, they are sure that the prophet said, Ali was his successor, fi ahli, among my kin. But later Shi'is amended the text, so it read fi ummati, so that Ali was his successor in the Muslim community. It's with this assumption that the authors uh, that I study in this work go about blunting the polemical edge of any pro-Ali hadith that they found which suggested that he should be caliph. They argue either she's made up these reports, embellished them, or read them out of their original context. Now, after the prophet's death, the question of who should succeed him fragmented the community. It fragmented his disciples into a number of, fra into a number of factions. The allegiances grew in their complexities as the decades passed. Here, I'll try to start with simplicity and then gradually add to this knowledge base to help us understand these, dis these disagreements. First, there are those who supported authority going to the most senior members of the Muslim community, those who had the most clout. This, this faction became partisans of the first three caliphs in Islamic history. Not only did they revere the memory of these three and view them as pious authorities, but also they based Islamic law and knowledge of religion on the followers of these three caliphs, Abu Bakr, Omar, and Uthman. The second faction consisted of those who believed Ali was the natural heir to the prophet. The clan to which both the prophet and Ali belonged was that of Hashem, and the Hashemid kinsmen and their partisans held Ali to be the most knowledgeable and distinguished of the prophet's disciples, and they revered him after his death when other Muslims did not. The third faction to consider is represented by the clan of Ali's predecessor, the Umayyads. Ali's predecessor, Uthman, was assassinated after a siege of his home that lasted many weeks, if not months. Uh, 
And the family of Uthman blamed Ali for these events, since those who had laid siege to the Caliph Som had respected Ali. Although Ali may not, may not have been involved in the assassination, the Umayyads considered anyone who had criticized Uthman culpable in this hyper-partisan atmosphere that believed, if you're not with us, you're against us, and you know, which fomented tribal feuds. Thus, when Ali became the fourth caliph, the Umayyads rebelled against him. To Ali's dismay, the partisans of the first three caliphs rebelled against him as well, and thus his caliphate was rocked with civil war after civil war. Now, to take a bird's eye view of how it all panned out, after Ali's assassination, the Umayyads take the reins of the caliphate and turn it into a dynastic monarchy. They rule for close to a century. Then there's a wide-scale revolt that foments from Central Asia and heads west to topple them in Arabia. The leaders of this revolt pledge allegiance to the old rivals of the Umayyads, the Hashemids. And the Hashemids then have their own monarchy for five centuries until another army, the Mongols, lay siege to the empire and end their rule. Now, if we wanted to take snapshots of allegiances to different religious and political authorities, 100 years after the prophet's death, it would look something like this. You have four factions with one of them split in two. You'd have those who revere the first three caliphs, those who revere the Umayyad dynasty, those who followed a Khadiji school, an independent school discussed in the book, but which we won't tonight. And then you have, uh, lastly, this pro-Ali faction split between those who say all authorities should remain exclusive to Ali and his family, and those who revered Ali and his descendants but were more broad in viewing other members of the community as authorities as well. For example, there may have been some who viewed the first two caliphs, Abu Bakr and Omar, as wise and pious leaders, but also respected Ali. They didn't view reverence for these different caliphs as necessarily contradictory. Now, if we try to take another snapshot 200 years after the prophet's death, these different circles would still be intact with the caveat that there is now a religious elite, scholars of the law and theology who've become fed up with caliphs claiming to be the successors to the prophet. They are the drivers of a new ethic that the scholars, the ulama, are the real heirs of the prophet, not the khulafa or the caliphs. So while you have scholars that identify with some of the above political factions, there's a set of centrist scholars who keep an ethic of, we will not judge uh, what happened in history because we don't have certainty on who was right and who was wrong in all of these conflicts uh, that occurred two centuries before. And so we'll leave it to God to decide who to punish and who to reward in the hereafter. And then there were some who had uh, a more radical optimism in how to understand the past. They said, we might have our own theories on who uh, was right and who was wrong, but we'll still maintain belief that God will forgive everyone who was involved since they were all believers. They were all uh, uh, faithful Muslims. Now, if we wanted to locate Sunnism, it's part of this burgeoning community of centrist scholars who acknowledge that their own teachers and authorities were part uh, of one of these factions, uh, even if centrists themselves were not. Thus, to read a Sunni Hadith collection is to read a work with contributions from those who are pro three caliph, pro Umayyad, pro Ali, or centrist. By contrast, it's fairly easy to read a Shi'i work and understand uh, the allegiances uh, that are at play with its authors. They're mostly they're mostly written by partisans of the family of Ali who viewed them. Uh, as rightful imams or leaders of the Muslim community, both in terms of political power and uh, religion. Our last snapshot is taken 300 years after the prophet. While I don't want to diminish the existence of other factions and schools, both within and outside of Sunnism and Shiism in terms of the enduring culture surrounding Ali, I describe Muslims as having one of six different views. The first group is made up of zealous pro three caliph, pro Umayyad or Khariji Muslims who publicly condemn Ali and his partisans as evil. The second group doesn't condemn Ali outright but opposes any special veneration of him. They tend to say he was a fallible person who may have committed blunders and that he may have harmed the Muslim community when he became caliph. And in fact, some denied that he had ever become a legitimate caliph to begin with, rather he was a an insurrectionist or a pretender to the throne. 
The third group became the orthodox position of Sunnism. Ali is accepted as the fourth rightly guided caliph. The fourth group regarded him as the greatest Muslim after the prophet, but didn't consider him divinely appointed to the position. They held Ali uh, as the wisest and the most meritorious Muslim uh, after the prophet, but didn't go so far to say that Muhammad appointed him before his death. The uh, fifth group, became the orthodox position of Shiism. Ali was the rightful heir of the prophet, selected by God and Muhammad before his death. The sixth group was made up of radical Shi'is or Gulat that viewed Ali as a manifestation of God. In late antiquity, the belief in humans either being divine or demigods was quite commonplace. It seems that uh, you had uh, multi you know, many cultures in the ancient Near East that believed that about rulers or had myths of this type regarding uh, holy men. It seems foreign to us now, but for the exception of Christianity, where God or the word is made flesh in Jesus. But in this circle, stories about Ali's miraculous power um, was one that extended over the universe. Uh, he was omnipotent, he was omniscient, and you know these were common motifs and stories about him. The absolute monotheism that usually is associated with Islam made group six uh, quite marginal and condemned by both Sunni and Shi'i scholars. If the spectrum could be laid out from one through six, or groups one through six, uh, meaning those who held animosity for Ali all the way down to those who believed in his divinity, it would look something like this slide. Now, all of this may seem a bit rudimentary, but I promise you the reason why I'm discussing this is that no one else has mapped out this spectrum or the nuances related uh, to the spectrum. Rather, the go-to model is anachronistic and tends to imagine Sunnism and Shiism as two branches that split apart at the prophet's death. While the argument may require some charitable readings, my argument would be this. Sunnism is so wide in scope that its literature preserves members who seem to occupy all six groups. If I was asked, I could place Sunni scholar or group in, um, in, in each of these categories. Shiism, by contrast, would only occupy uh, categories four through six on this spectrum. Again, uh, to, to summarize, group one held animosity for Ali. Group two opposed his uh, praise and veneration. Group three uh, accepted him as a rightly guided caliph. Group four held him to be superior to all other disciples of Muhammad. Group five held that God and the prophet had anointed him Muhammad's rightful heir and group six upheld his divinity. So if we were to zoom out 300 years after the prophet's death, uh, it's here that we can be certain people self-identify as Sunni or Shi'i. We can also discuss some of the cultural currents associated with a lay person belonging to each faction. And so what is it that we find? Shi'is can be accurately described as centering Ali or the prophet's family at the core of their religious culture. They have separate circles of learning, separate books and rituals that Sunnis do not. For pro-Ali Sunnis, by this point, they've come to revere Ali in very similar ways to Shi laypersons. He's a hero who's remembered as unparalleled in wisdom and in combat. And the prophet's descendants are also revered in Sunni societies as nobility. And then we have those Sunnis who are skeptical of all of this reverence for Ali and the authenticity of hadith that praise him. They tend to show sympathy for Ali's antagonists, the Umayyads, and scholars who are anti-Shi. Thus, when they discuss history, it's one that aims to discredit pro-Ali arguments and texts. And then there are those Sunnis who are mostly neutral on history, either in being uninformed or consciously not wanting to wade in controversial waters. Some Sunni laypersons remained aloof from these uh, debates about history. The cultural code here is, I don't want to accidentally say something about a sacred figure that will offend God, who will then punish me in the hereafter. As a result, I neither discuss nor take any position regarding these historical conflicts. If the previous slide discussed laypersons, then here we can take a moment to consider the efforts of Sunni scholars who viewed themselves as representatives of orthodoxy. First, they sought to support and condemn overt anti-Ali sentiment in Sunni literature that was transmitted. It became heresy to curse Ali or accuse him of sinfulness after two centuries in which this may have been found in different geographic regions. 
So searching for these texts at times feels like looking for needles in a haystack. While I want to take all the credit for finding these exceptional cases by browsing and reading every single uh, volume cover to cover, my work is profoundly aided in the digital world where I can use string searches to go through databases that have digitized thousands of medieval Islamic texts. Second, Sunni scholars aim to discredit any whiff of Shiism in their works. This included texts portraying Ali as superior to his predecessors or noting any disagreements he had with them. For example, after the Prophet's death, when Ali, Fatima, and the Prophet's family had disagreements with the first caliph, Abu Bakr, some scholars rationalized that such reports were likely false because it didn't sit well with them to see these figures portrayed in this way. Third, scholars circ circulated reports in which Ali appeared as a fallible person. They may have done this unintentionally for two reasons. First, this organically happened whenever they drew on the legacy or contributions of people who are pro-3 pro caliph or Umayyad, um, as my research demonstrates. And second, it was in fidelity to their belief in the canonical culture of Hadith or the historicity of reports about Muhammad's sayings in these sacred collections that led scholars to say, well, in this case, Ali must have upset the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, a famous example in the collection of uh, Bukhari, that canonical collection I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, is that when the Prophet visits the home of Ali and Fatima for night prayers or night worship, uh, they refuse to join him and the prophet rebukes them um, and, and he walks away from their home. Or there's another report in which Ali tries to take on a second wife uh, and marry the daughter of a famous uh, opponent uh, of the Muslim community who had um, uh, persecuted Muslims for their faith. And the prophet again uh, delivers a public sermon rebuking Ali for his desire to take on uh, another wife uh, and, and uh, have a marriage alliance with this, with this personality. Now, two centuries after the fall of the Umayyads, Ali was now a respected figure in Sunni culture. In this new context, scholars now always assumed that Ali would be forgiven, uh, and the error at stake was not so egregious as to lead him to be, uh, as to believe that he'd be condemned. It's here we see how the reception of literature antagonistic to Ali in its origins can end up in circles that will charitably uh, read these texts as not to condemn him, uh, although I'd argue the original authors had certainly intended to uh, denigrate Ali in transmitting these stories. So let me close by stating that partisanship and the polarization of society, uh, of society outlasted the lifetimes of the seventh century rulers of Arabia. Muslim literature, both canonical and uh, non-canonical, preserves the sentiments of these uh, various factions. A study of the formation of Sunni orthodoxy regarding Ali is a study of all of these factions or all of these sentiments. Lastly, I'd argue that polarization in American politics today is reminiscent of seventh century Hashemid and Umayyad rivalries and the historiography that ensued. Uh, President Obama is viewed as a good person and a righteous leader uh, by many of his admirers, but he's reviled as evil and illegitimate by a rival tribe. 200 years from now, there'll be partisans of Obama and many historians who will praise him, but also a threat of antagonists or critics relying on Fox News reporting or right-wing authors or foreign journalists or foreign war, uh, war correspondents who will claim that Obama was not the praiseworthy person that people remember, especially in terms of his policy related to drone warfare. The same goes for Trump, who's a polarizing figure with avid followers. As we speak, we're creating competing historiographies and leaving them for posterity. As the decades pass, let us not be surprised with the spectrum that unfolds as it did in Islamic history. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Nabil. I'll remind people uh, that you can put questions in the chat. Um, and it might be good to close out the, yeah, the PowerPoint uh, so that uh, people can do that. Uh, or you can use the raise hand function. Um, but since I'm, uh, uh, since I'm the director, I can uh, jump in and ask the first question. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious um, if as later Sunni scholars wrestled uh, with the question of uh, Ali and his place, did any of them make 
a distinction between him and his immediate descendants, or by that time were the, uh, were the struggles with the Umayyad so far past that uh, uh, they are less important than Ali in the whole question. Thank you so much. So in terms of, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the slide, I showed you that portrait of Ali and then his two prominent sons who also happen to be grandsons of the prophet. And so when we talk about historiography of Ali, Ali, Hassan and Hussein, those two sons, usually are grouped together in the way that Muslims dealt with, uh, or the way that Sunnis dealt with that history, in that uh, memories of Ali, Hassan and Hussein are usually restricted to the lifetime of the prophet and discussions about their political history after the prophet's death is usually um, uh, uh, put to the side because once you open up that can of worms, you get into the polemics of how, uh, of trying to deal with this legacy of texts that are pro-Ali, anti-Ali or pro or critical of the descendants versus uh, praising them. And it's this uh, tension in dealing with certainly pro-Ali sentiments within the Sunni community, but then those that were pro-Umayyad and pro three caliph that lead some scholars to um, uh, take a partisan uh, a perspective on it in that some will lead pro, some will lean pro-Ali and Hassan and Hussein, uh, venerate them in the way that Shi'is do, uh, claim that their political careers were one that were in line with the will of God and, were and that they were righteous and just leaders, while others will uh, take a more critical approach and say that quietism should have been uh, uh, the approach that they took and that these leaders made mistakes. As to uh, Ali, um, as to the descendants of Ali that, let's say, speaking 100 to 200 to 300 years later, uh, the, uh, the method which Sunnis use to rehabilitate those figures are, uh, are you, you could say, are diverse. Some will be rehabilitated and made to uh, appear in line with Sunnism, while once you get to 300 years later, where the identities are crystallized and it's clear that many of Ali's are actually many of Ali's descendants are actually Shiite or Shi, at that point, uh, those individuals are ignored and excised from uh, Sunni historiography, and, and they're just not dealt with. Thanks. Mm -hmm. For those of you who have questions, um, again, you can put it in the chat. Also, since we can't see everybody on the screen, it's helpful to use the raise hand um, uh, function, even you know, if you want to be called upon. Uh, Nabil, do you want to call on folks, or do you want me to? Uh, Hugh, you're welcome to take it away. Okay. So I see David uh, Kling has a question. Uh, yeah, David, I think you're still muted. Uh, D David, you have to mute, unmute yourself first. Oh. Uh, uh, not sure. Oni, can you try How's that? that? Oh, yes. There you All go. right. <laughs> well, I've said everything I've wanted to say already, so there's no more to say. No. <laughs> um, as you know, I've read your book, and it's, it's just a wonderful um, unpacking of the complexity of, of um, Sony and Shiite responses to uh, Ali. I have actually a larger question or more general question, because you were talking about the the assassinations, the violence, the revolts, and all of that. And I'm sure you can find analogous um, incidents within other religious traditions. But I guess my question is, is it, is it because of the, the sort of immutable tie between what we would call church and state? Um, was there any anything like a pacifist tradition within Islam to um, uh, prophetically pronounce against this kind of stuff? So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. It's so a big much. question. Thank you so much. No, I, I would say that uh, when I mentioned those centrist scholars and that ethic that developed a hundred years uh, after the Prophet Muhammad, many of those centrist scholars. Uh, 
had what I would call a quietist ethic, or um, they, they favored quietism in that they argued that taking up arms against the ruler uh, led to chaos, and this led to bloodshed, and chaos and bloodshed, uh, and, and bloodshed was condemned in the Quran as the worst uh, thing that can happen in the world and that stability and order are, I mean, I guess one uh, mm, quote that we hear uh, among politicians say, law and order was uh, important uh, and uh, was the key principle that uh, Muslims should maintain at that time. This, this ethic of, um, of staying at home, even when the rulers were tyrants and that obeying the rulers was uh, a way in which uh, society could maintain peace and order um, was something that pro uh, Ali um, theologians considered a critique of Ali. Um, they considered it as as a soft critique of him, not a direct critique of Ali and his uh, descendants, because uh, Ali and his descendants had um, cultivated a um, a. Uh, a reputation for being activists, for being political activists, both in word and in leading insurrections. So when someone held this quietist um, ethic, it was viewed as anti-Ali uh, by Ali's partisans. That being said, the majority of Muhammad's disciples are considered quietists, people who refused to uh, enter the civil wars when the civil wars began. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question, and forgive me if I get the name wrong, but uh, Sana Haq, you can, you can correct my pronunciation if you like. You'll have to unmute yourself, Sana. Uh, we may have to unmute, and I'm having or you can, Or Sana, you can write it in the chat, the question that you have. Thank you. Um, yes, it's saying that um, only host can unmute. It's giving that error message and the chat oh. is also disabled. So other people aren't, <laughs> oh. aren't able to post uh, so, anything either. <laughs> yeah, so but, we'll, we'll work on, on uh, only maybe if you could work on the chat and uh, I, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Um, my question, uh, I guess it goes a little bit um, beyond the scope of the, the talk today, but I, I wonder, it's kind of a twofold question. Um, I wonder if in your research you found um, what might have motivated that revisionist attitude towards um, the image of Ali, especially amongst um, Sunnis. Um, and then I also wonder if there is a connection with the, the incident at Karbala and if the retelling or, or the you know memorializing the incident every year had an effect on maybe moving the needle towards a more accepting attitude towards Ali's legacy. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Thank you. Right. So the, uh, in terms of the impetus to rehabilitating Ali's uh, character from someone who's fraught with conflict to someone who's now a pious saint, I'd argue that over, over the 200 years, uh, ap the first 200 years after the prophet's death, in that first 100 years, you have all of these fr uh, fragmented factions which are condemning the leaders of other factions, meaning condemning other disciples of Muhammad. And that by the time you get to 200 years after the prophet, there is this new ethic that anyone who saw the prophet and was a Muslim, any contemporary of Muhammad who was a Muslim was a righteous figure. And that this doctrine, Adalat al-Sahaba, as, it, as it's known in Sunnism, or the righteousness of companions, um, began to be accepted by the scholar, Sunni scholarly community about 200 years after the prophet. So as this ethic was accepted, there was this impetus to go back and now re-understand history. And so that meant not only was Ali to be rehabilitated, but all other companions who engaged in political conflicts were to be understood to be as righteous individuals who fell into conflict and that these conflicts were fomented by outsiders in the Muslim community, that Muslims themselves were not the source of this civil strife, but there were outsiders who, who, who caused this. And um, so that's the, that's the answer to your first question. As to the massacre of uh, Ali's son Hussein and other descendants of the prophet, uh, there is this culture among Hussein's descendants and then the larger Shi community to remember this event annually. 
and it seems about um, you know 100 to 200 years after the prophet, it seems to be an annual um, uh, ritual. In terms of affecting Sunni perceptions of Hussein, one could say that there are uh, historical texts that are written about 150 years uh, after the Prophet. So, for example, the Maqdal of Hussein, written by Abu Mikhnaf, who dies about 150 years after the Prophet, uh, is written at this time and it's circulated among uh, uh, different communities, uh, as, you know, beginning in Iraq. But then you have uh, one of the most celebrated historians of. Uh, Sunni history uh, or Sunni historiography, uh, Tabari, who includes uh, Abu Mikhnaf's retelling of this event. And so the sense that I get is that uh, uh, this memorializing of Hussein and um, uh, one's a great sympathy for uh, the Prophet's family was something uh, that seems to have been accepted by Sunnis within 200 to 300 years after the Prophet. And one could point to these texts uh, that are written uh, about a century after him and which are read in Shi'i circles, but then also seems to have been uh, supported by Sunni historiographers as well. I've now changed the setting so participants can unmute themselves. Um, uh, so, Nasi. Um, uh, I, can you try that? And uh, I, think, uh, I think I unmuted myself successfully. Right. Yeah. Hi, Nabil. How are you? Um, good to see you, and and happy to have listened to you again. I'm I'm always excited when I know that you have a talk coming. Um, I'm always looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, I had two questions for you. The first is I was very interested about those Sunnis that considered the divinity of Ali. Um, mm -hmm. But, but particularly today, in today's context, um, who are the Sunnis, and I'm assuming that these are uh, Sunnis from Sufi orders that still uh, see Ali as a source of emulation. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. And, and I had a second question, if, if you have time. And the second question is, how does this conversation fit um, into the conversations that we're having today? Um, you know, what, are, what are the contemporary implications? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Right. So when I said that I can put a Sunni group in each category, uh, it's not Sunnis that are alive today. <laughs> so I'm giving myself uh, liberty to look at Sunnis in history. And in terms of those who upheld his divinity, there was this period after the fall of the Abbasid Empire and before the rise of the Safavid uh, Empire in which Persian Sufism uh, had held sway. And even in parts of the Levant, there were Sufis that were associated with um, divination. Like, so they believed in Ilm al Jifr, which is like this ability to like read books and like, you know, see things uh, regarding the future. So those who are engaged in numerology, divination, occultism, uh, were individuals that also revered Ali as this manifestation of God. Um, uh, 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 and again, they're about 500 to 600 years after the prophet, and you find them in Syria and Iraq and then Persian uh, Sufism as well. There is also a group known as the Hurufis um, uh, or Ottoman Hurufism, uh, where again, related to this letterism or occultism and numerology, uh, they upheld Ali's divinity. And the Safavids, before they converted to Shiism themselves, were a Sunni uh, Sufi uh, militia that uh, was very Ali-centric. Um, Persian Sufis such as the Qizilbash that became part of the uh, you know, Ottoman uh, uh, military um, uh, also upheld uh, Ali's divinity. But again, their association with Shiism was something, there was a conversion process that occurred from being Ali-centric Sufis that also believed in his divinity and then uh, becoming Shis later. As for the implications today, uh, of my work, I pointed to this idea that our political leaders have partisans and they have their antagonists and that their, partis their partisans and antagonists are writing history, writing about these figures as we know it. And that 200 to 250 years from now, we are gonna be dealing with that same uh, uh, diversity of sources as we do 
with these earlier uh, with these earlier rulers that you have people who praise them, you have people who criticize them, and that there are processes at stake in how people uh, understand those those leaders and then how they understand themselves and why they are followers of those leaders. Um, and then there's also the broader issue of sectarianism that uh, just as American politics is hyperpartisan, religious, ethnic, and religious identities in the Middle East are also um, a, a, a flashpoint. Um, it, it's also hyperpartisan, or you could say sectarian in many ways. People dehumanize those who uh, belong to this other. Uh, so, you know, Arab Shis are a minority uh, and they are uh, dehumanized in many different ways. One of the ways is that they're accused of being agents of Iran. They're accused of being, you know, not really Muslim as, you know, these heretics, these non believers. And uh, anti Shi polemicists will argue it's because these Shis believe X, Y, and Z. The argument that this book makes is that. The boundaries between Sunnism and Shiism are not so clear, and that there is a, a, a very wide spectrum of how one can understand Sunnism. And if Sunnism today acknowledged that wide spectrum, perhaps some of you know the barometer or the, the temperature of sectarianism can calm down once we have a little bit of a historical perspective on things that people associate with Shiism. And, you know, with many minorities, there is, um, you could say, uh, accusations are made not in good faith. And, um, you know, as an academic, perhaps I'm being quite optimistic and saying, oh, if only if only people educated themselves, then, you know, these differences would go in. You know, that's not the case because many times these, yeah, you know, people, there are other reasons why people condemn someone who is unlike them. And, you know, there are questions of politics and power. Um, uh, but hegemony and orthodoxy is something that develops over time. And I think that's something that we see in this book as well, that something that we associate with Sunnism or something that we associate with Shiism is not there from the beginning. This is a process that happens over centuries. And when we look at this history, uh, the reason for which there is this cult around Ali or that there is this school of thought uh, known as Shiism exists, it's because there was this other side of the coin, uh, this, uh, you know, this other group that condemned Ali. And so it provides a you know, a raison d'etre of why Shiism exists when you study this history and you see that there was this polarization that occurred around Ali and his legacy. I think Bill is next. You'll have to be unmuted. Yeah, I'm unmuted. All right. Hey, Nabil. Hi, Bill. Um, so I have this question. Uh, uh, it's a little, a little vague. Were there material consequences to positions that people took on Ali. Um, and particularly, I'm interested in, in Sunni. If, I mean, this is, sounds like an option for Sunni Muslims. They could think one thing about him. They could think two things about him. They could shift their positions. I mean, just because the idea was there doesn't mean people were attracted to it, except maybe in certain times he looked good. But I'm sort of wondering, I mean, normally, when people pick these allegiances, there's something material at stake in addition to whatever religious principles they may they may offer. I mean, you could talk about different visions of Jesus in the history, and I mean, it was never without without consequence in terms of of the of uh, land and territory, et cetera. So I'm wondering, in all of this, what was it what was at stake, uh, or what can you say what was at stake materially for people? to take positions about Ali. Thank you. So I would say the Shi position is a dangerous one. If you were accused of Shiism, you opened yourself to persecution. You opened yourself to losing your land, perhaps a, you know, a, a non-state militia attacking uh, your home, burning down your home or attacking you and so on. Uh, as for a Sunni, again, with this spectrum that exists, uh, the, uh, the question here is politics. So the rehabilitation of Ali uh, first occurs as a, um, as, a as a public policy during the time of a caliph uh, 
who identified himself as a pro-Ali figure that was group four. This is a man named Ma'mun, 200 years after the prophet. He says, I see all of these people condemning Ali. I'm a Hashemid kinsman, and I'm going to make it my mission to rehabilitate this person. And all of these Sunni scholars who are condemning him, I am going to basically delegitimize and disc discredit this orthodox movement that not only condemns Shiism, but also condemns me as a caliph, as someone who doesn't know anything and who's not truly the successor of the prophet. So Ma'mun in supporting the rehabilitation of Ali, in a sense, wanted to discredit the rising authority of Sunni scholars who uh, held a different ideology that, you know, there was these rightly guided caliphs, but Ali was not the best. And uh, he was engaged in polemics with them. The problem with uh, polemicists or theologians that wrote on this uh, conflict was depending on the time and place, depending on the caliph in power, they could be sacked of their position based on the based on their views of Ali as well. So, you know, one of the guys that I study in chapter three is a polemicist named Jahid, and he he. I'm not going to say he pretends, but he is a this diet. He engages in these dialectics so that he writes entire treatises supporting the authority of the first three caliphs and why Ali was not the best. And then he writes another one about why Ali is the best. And then he writes another one, you know, why Zaidi Shiism is quite logical in its argument. And so, like, his ability to be a shapeshifter is something that's confounded historians. But in reality, he was a person who lived close to a century and he lived with different caliphs coming, you know, to power and, uh, and leaving power. And he was, he, he had close connections with the Abbasid Caliph. So um, there was an incentive for him to uh, distance himself from this debate, but also be aware of the conflicts uh, about it. Now, as the centuries pass, just because the Abbasids remain in power for 500 years, that doesn't mean that they, you know, that authority was centralized and that, you know, they were authoritarian rulers. In fact, in fact, there were times in which they were puppets and that the warlords who came to power uh, were themselves Shi'i or the warlords that came to power uh, were themselves Sunni. So, you know, there's a century... Uh, in the 10th century, in which the Buyids from Dalem, from Persia, take over the Abbasid Caliphate. And it's during that time that Shiism has a renaissance. And it's during that time that partisanship for Ali was in vogue, even among Sunnis. And so you had individuals who uh, tried to show how they were pro-Ali during this time, uh, or those who jumped on the boat of rehabilitating him uh, during this time. And so I'd argue, yeah, politics plays a role in the background of why people are writing what they're writing uh, about Ali. Okay, so just so there were, so were non-theological stakes, that's my point. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you, it's helpful to look at who's ruling at the time when you're looking at it. <laughs> well, I, I, the only reason I raise the issue is that because if you compare the history of Judaism to this, what you see is not that kind, that particular kind of struggle. And partly that's because the Jews never really had any any political power, and so they the I mean there were issues about who was in charge and who was right, but there was nothing like nothing comparable to to what you're describing in Islam, which begins with a very powerful figure who ran a state for ten years and I mean was political was powerful on earth as well as in heaven um, from day one. So I that's why I was in, interested to see how that played out. So thanks. Sure, you can also say that those who claimed. Uh, to succeed the prophet had an incentive to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis Ali as well, right? And so if you're claiming to have the mantle of the prophet after him, that religious and political authority belongs to you, you had to make sense of this history in a way that uh, justified you having that mantle after him as well. Yeah. yeah I hope I have enabled the people to put questions in the chat. Um, we're coming towards the end of the hour, but I'll wait just a little bit. Um, and I apologize. We only- It says the chat is disabled, Hugh. It's, it's still disabled. Okay. Because it's recording. So it says it, the chat isn't working. Okay. Um, for some reason, the, the settings are a little different this time than last time we used this format. So I'm, we'll have to look into that. So if there are any questions, I'm afraid then I can't figure out how to, uh, how to deal with that. Um, 
So please then do raise your hand. And again, I apologize for the confusion on, on the muting and so forth. Uh, we got one, yeah, Shaza says she can use the chat. So, um, so we'll wait just a minute or two. Um, and uh, while, yeah. Um, okay, so it is working. Uh, yeah, all of a sudden it's working. So you yeah. did whatever you did, you did it right. Okay, so uh, Shaza asks, uh, well, uh, about the Ottoman Empire and its impact on this split. Sure, so uh, by the time uh, the Ottomans uh, come to power, you also have a shift in Sunni sensibilities where it's not just Ali is a rightly guided, rightly guided caliph, but he's the, you have these Ali-centric Sufi communities, and not just the Sufis. You have uh, blacksmiths, you have soldiers that have now taken on Ali as their hero. And so they'll, you know, in their helmets, you'll have uh, in calligraphy Ali written because he's like this patron saint of soldiers and that, you know, blacksmiths who are creating all of these different weapons and swords will remember the sword of Ali, which is, you know, uh, famed in Islamic history. So by the time you have the rise of the Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman Empire, you also have the Safavid Empire, which is uh, a, a Shi empire dedicated to the cult of Ali. But the Safavids make a point to, uh, um, uh, to assimilate this pro-Ali culture uh, in their lands so that you know, Ali is not exclusively a Shi hero, but one that is uh, venerated in, uh, amongst uh, Sunni lay persons and by the sultans. In fact, it's under the Ottoman sultans that descendants of Ali and the prophet uh, have tax uh, exempt status. It's during the time of the Ottomans that descendants of Ali and the prophet wear distinctive headgear that, you know, there are people who wear turbans of different colors. It's only the descendants of Ali and the prophet that wear the color green, that are only allowed to wear the color green uh, because green is associated with um, the prophet and the people of heaven and that, you know, uh, the descendants of the prophet are associated uh, with these sacred figures and uh, uh, these sacred places. Um, it's during this period that you also have hostels that are created exclusively for descendants of the prophet and Ali. So uh, the, the Ottomans make a point to also create calligraphy venerating not just Ali and his two sons, but other imams in Shi history. So that, you know, there's 12 or Shiism that venerates 12 imams. The Ottomans also venerate these imams as well in their, um, in some of the architecture that they build. Um, and I think we'll take one uh, last question uh, from uh, Muhammad Humayun, uh, if you could, uh, I hope you can unmute yourself. Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, so go good ahead. to see you, Nabil, and good to see you, David, as well. Uh, Hello, Mohammed. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad the book is out. I read it. It's amazing. Uh, so congratulations. This is a major milestone. Uh, so job well done. So I had a uh, question. I think you briefly mentioned Ibn Taymiyyah. I was wondering if maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on Ibn Taymiyyah and, and his, you know, uh, obviously quite controversial attitude uh, towards, uh, towards Ali and how it could have uh, contributed to, to the split and making it even more, you know, polarized in a sense and injecting some, you know, uh, a lot of politics into it that we're, you know, we're living even today. All right. Thank you. So chapter five of my book is arguably the longest chapter in my book. I, I, I go deep, uh, I take a deep dive into uh, one of the most venerated uh, scholars in uh, Sunni, in the Sunni world today, uh, meaning in Saudi Arabia, you have this Salafi, this conservative uh, Salafi culture that has published the works of this scholar this um, uh, 13th, uh, 12th and 13th century, or to, uh, excuse me, 12th century uh, and 13th century scholar, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, who's uh, based in the Levant. Uh, he's writing under the Mamluks. Uh, 
Um, but uh, he is someone who's uh, what one can consider very conservative or very strict in his worldview. He's one could say he takes a he has a Puritan outlook and that he's very critical and dismissive of Islamic intellectual history and believes in the necessity of going back to these pure sources, the Quran and Hadith and understanding just what is considered part of uh, scripture or this, you know, these canonical texts. But he's very popular today in these ultra conservative circles, and he almost needs no introduction in many, uh, you know, Sunni households or Sunni mosques. It's it, like if you have a an, an opinion attributed to Ibn Taymiyyah, then, you know, it's something that's followed, you know, for these conservative Sunnis. So that's why I, I, you know, I focus on what he has to say, because he also writes the longest refutation of Shiism in Sunni history. It's something that runs like eight volumes. And, um, you know, it's uh, hundreds of pages or, you know, uh, uh, more than a thousand pages, and depending on the printing that you have. Uh, and he takes a very hard line uh, perspective in condemning not just Shiism, but pro-Ali culture in general. The one that I just talked about that was prominent in the Ottoman, in the Ottoman world, or the one that took hold of Sunnism over the centuries. Uh, that gradually became, you know, pro Ali and Ali centric. He's he condemns all of it. He thinks any text that seems to promote a veneration of Ali is one that has been embellished by Shi's or is just a complete uh, fabrication. And so that hardline perspective, this anti Shi perspective, uh, is one that has become normative during this hyper partisan uh, or sectarian. A world in which uh, Saudi Arabia views uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran as this existential threat or a threat in the region. And so it's become quite in vogue to cite Ibn Taymiyyah in online uh, Arabic, like on, on, in Arabic websites to condemn all Shi'is using some of the uh, characterizations that Ibn Taymiyyah used and using some of the quotes that he had about how they are all you know, uh, perhaps to be killed when he's speaking about a specific region or that uh, because he was also part of a military campaign uh, to, uh, to, to essentially wipe out uh, a threat, a uh, Shi community and other uh, others who lived in uh, what is now modern day Lebanon um, uh, because they were considered a threat to the Mamluk empire and that they had been supportive of another one. But in any case, uh, many of his hardline perspectives are quoted today and again, it increases the temperature of sectarianism and in, in, in not only in the Gulf, but in the region. Um, and as he's translated into other languages, perhaps people will see this. What I've done in my book is I've taken every quote that I could from his multi-volume refutation of Shiism and focused on what he says about Ali and this history and his family and about this history. And we see that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah seems to take a perspective that draws on this group one, this anti-Ali uh, 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 history, and then also draws on group two, those who oppose the veneration of Ali, but didn't necessarily condemn him. Ibn Taymiyyah includes both of um, materials from both of those groups in his refutation of Shiism, even though he considers himself a Sunni, which was part of group three. And I show how the dynamics of engaging in this and this anti shi polemics leads some Sunni scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah to draw on this earlier uh, literature, which Sunnism as a, uh, as a sect condemns and says, okay, those people were wrong, but he, in a sense, advocates and resurrects many of these perspectives. And, and in fact, uh, it's important that people understand that his position is not one that is moderate, but in fact, a very extreme and polemical, and polemical one. And I think in providing his work in English, uh, perhaps for the first time, especially in an appendix where I, tra I, I translate much of what, he's, what he says that's relevant to this work, um, people will, you know, will, will understand the perspective that he took better and that he's not just, um, you know, not just an authority that one can cite on the history of Ali and Shiism. Um, uh, not a neutral authority that one can cite, you know. Well, we're uh, about 10 minutes past nine, so I think uh, it's uh, time to call a halt to this uh, very productive discussion. Um, and so 
uh, I will, uh, first of all, thank everybody for coming uh, and uh, thank Nabil for giving this really interesting talk and for this uh, great work you're doing. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, uh, do the applause reaction, <laughs> which we can do in this context. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to hear me. Have a good night.